Second Chronicles chapter 8 And it came to pass at the end of twenty years, wherein Solomon had built the house of the Lord and his own house, that the cities which Haram had restored to Solomon, Solomon built them and caused the children of Israel to dwell there. So not only does Solomon build his house, he builds a temple, but he's building the cities round about Jerusalem. He's making uh, Jerusalem more livable. He's uh, building uh, army places. He's building uh, all these places for people to live. And it's fortified the, the nation and the kingdom. <clears throat> and so Solomon went to Hamath Zoveth and prevailed against it. And he built Tadmor in the wilderness and all the store cities which he built in Hamath. Also he built Beth Haran, the upper, and Beth Haran, the neither, fence cities with walls, gates, and bars. All right. Um, the upper would be, you know, it's up on a hill or up, up on a mountain, and neither would be the lowest part. So um, Beth Haran had, uh, it's an area that's it's, it's, it's on a hill, it's graded, or on a mountain. <clears throat> And Beleth, and all the store cities that Solomon had, and all the chariot cities, and the cities of the horsemen, and all that Solomon desired to build in Jerusalem. So Solomon had places where he had stocks, uh, food, weaponry, probably wines, grains, anything. That's what a store city would be. And then he had cities for his horsemen. He had so many horses and so many men riding them and all that. He had their own city. Listen, Solomon's your first cowboy movie. It would be a corral. That's what he built. And it would be particular cities where all, you know, all these horsemen would, would you know, make a living, where they would live, they'd buy their stuff and eat and take care of their horses and everything like that. And probably had the doctors for the horses and for the men. <clears throat> and all Solomon desired to build in Jerusalem and in Lebanon. So it wasn't just Jerusalem. He built all around. And throughout all the land of his dominion. And his dominion went all the way to the Euphrates River. And as for all the people that were left of the Hittites, they were supposed to be gone. The Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Havites, and the Jebusites, which were not of Israel. They were supposed to be all gone. But since the complete disobedience to God's word in Joshua and in Judges, here they still are. God told them to literally wipe them all out. You know why it's important to mention the Perizzites, the Hivites, Jebusites, and the Havites, and all that? Because this is going to be some of the people that Solomon's going to get married to, along with Egypt. And he wasn't supposed to. But of their children, who were left after them in the land, whom the children of Israel consumed not, then did Solomon make the pay tribute unto this day. That's not what God told them to do. Solomon all to pray to the Lord and say, Lord, you know, you did tell us to get rid of these nations. We didn't do it. What do you want us to do? He doesn't seek God at all. But if I pay, you know, if I put a tax on them, you know, it's okay. Listen, that's the same thing in America is. If we can put a tax on it, it's okay. It's illegal if we can't put a tax on it. But of the children of Israel did Solomon make no servants for his work. But they were men of war, and chief of his captains, and captains of his chariots and horsemen. Looks like he what he's saying here is I mean it didn't say it doesn't say the children of Israel didn't do no work at all. What he's probably saying is that all the disgusting work, all the main hard laborous work he made these people do but the best jobs he gave to the Jews. And that of the army he gave to the Jews. 
and that the chariots and the horses and all that. And it keeps saying chariots and horses. That seems to be, looks like the main thing in, in Solomon's life. He built cities for them. He built places for them. And here they're mentioned again. And these were the chief of King Solomon's officers, even 250 that bear rule over the people. So he, there were people that were, had rulers over people. They were bosses. They were managers. That's a Bible thing. You can have people over other people. <clears throat> and Solomon brought up the daughter of Pharaoh out of the city of David unto the house that he had built for her. Wrong thing to do because God told them, don't go back to Egypt. He Listen, the whole story of their fathers, the whole story of Abraham, and to today, I, I mean today in Chronicles, is don't go to Egypt. Stop going to Egypt. All right, you're going to go to Egypt. I'm going to make you guys serve with rigor. I'm going to teach you a lesson. You're going to want to leave the country. And when they did leave the country, many times in the wilderness, oh, we want to go back. And that pictures a Christian as they're walking along. They want to keep relying on the on the world and not the Lord. Oh, I'm in trouble. I need money, so I'll go to the plastic. Oh, I got to have a wife or I got to have a husband, so I'll go to Egypt and get a wife. And then later on when we get married, I'll bring them up right, and they'll be, you know, we'll be happy together and all that. Or, you know, I got to get a job. You know, the Bible says we've got to work, so I'll just go get a job in Egypt. And that's not what the thing is. God doesn't want you. Egypt is a type of world. Egypt is a type of place that will put you under bondage. Scripture with scripture. It says, My wife shall not dwell in the house of David, king of Israel, because the places are holy, whereunto the ark of the Lord hath come. So Solomon knows full well that this marriage is not of God. Now let me ask you a question. And I'm going to go to the New Testament. People, you know, they're so hard up on this divorce and remarriage and all that. And the Bible says, and it does say, what, ma what man has joined, I mean, what God has joined together, let man not put asunder. I hope I got that verse right. If I don't, I put it under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. What God has joined together, let man not put asunder. That's that's a great verse for everyone will throw at you. Can you throw that verse at Solomon and his wife for Egypt? That's right. It's not approved by God. What do you do when you go over the book of Ezra when they tell the priest, say, listen, get rid of those wives you married? And they got rid of them. I'm going to tell you something. And any Baptist preacher, or any Baptist out there going to hear this, they're going to, they're just going to sleep down in their coffin. They're going to die and swander and, and get upset and all that. Listen, God does not honor a marriage between a, between a saved person and an unsaved person. God had nothing to do with that. Read what Paul speaks about marriage. He even tells you, if you're saved, you do not marry an unbeliever. And going by what is written here by the Holy Spirit, by Solomon keeping her away from the holy things, he knows full well that this woman is not sanctioned by God. You know what this picture is? This picture is that sin that you enjoy. You know it's a sin. You know God doesn't like it, but you enjoy it. And that picture is a snake. A boa constrictor. It's not like a rattlesnake, you know, where he, you know, he moves his tail, you know he's there and he bites you, and the poison goes up through your body and you drop dead. No, that's not what it's like. It's like the boa constrictor. A boa constrictor does not bite you. What he does, he comes, he wraps around his play. And he wraps himself around a little mouse or bird, whatever it is, and that bird will start breathing, or continue to breathe. And as it exhales the snake wraps itself a little closer 
And the bird tries to inhale, and he's not going to get all the air that he's able to get because he can't expand his, his, his lungs and the ribs. And he, inhale, and he exhales again, and that snake wraps around more and gets tighter. And they try to take another breath, and it's not as much as the last breath. And it's never much more as the last breath that was taken. And as that bone constriction just takes away the breath of that beast, of that be prey, whatever it has, then finally you can't breathe that no, no more. And that's what sin does. That's what sin will do to you. It just keeps taking a breath from you, keeps taking a breath from you, and there's really no struggle to the very end. When you just can't take that last breath, and then you're dead. And everybody's got this particular sin. Listen, what's it saying over in the book of Hebrews about Moses? The pleasures of sin for a sin. Listen, your holy Bible, get this. The holy Bible that God written with the Holy Spirit says that pleasures of sin. Uh, Gotta change that. Listen, if it wasn't pleasurable, how could Satan get you? Why is it all the good food is yucky and all the bad food is yummy? Then Solomon offered burnt offerings unto the Lord. Well, isn't that interesting? On the altar of the Lord, which he had built before the porch. He knows this woman is the wrong woman, but I'm going to go and give my burnt offerings. I'm going to sacrifice to the Lord. Is he able to bring his sin? Is he able to bring for him, honey? Is he, is he able to bring that her to, to the sacrifice? Have you ever seen somebody, you know, just openly? I mean, a Christian say they know. Just have a pack of cigarettes sitting in their hand. You ever see a guy come walking to church with a six pack of beer? No. You can't bring your, your sins to the Lord. I mean, literally bring your, sin, your sins to the Lord. You can't. But you keep on going with your life, and you keep on, you know, you got the you got the life of the Lord, and you got the life of the sin. And if you're not careful like Solomon, you're going to lose because you're going to go to the sin more than you are to the Lord. Now, we're all sinners. But you can't let your sin win. Give up your sin for one day. Say, Lord, just, listen, I'm, I'm not going to quit. Just one day. I'm going to go without it one day just for you, Lord. And see where in your life, if God is ruling or that sin, if you can just give it up one day. Now imagine me, a man studying for the ministry, a Baptist, born again, independent, fundamental, telling you just give up your sin for one day. Just do it. Try it. Can you do it? And if you can tell the Lord and give it up for one day, amen, you got the glory in God. You may get complete victory over that sin. But within that 24 hours, if you can't give up that sin, you need some serious prayer. Because guess who's in charge? <clears throat> Even at a certain rate every day. So he's faithful every day. Offering according to the commandment of Moses. He's following the law. He knows what the law says. You gotta get that. You really gotta understand that. On the Sabbath and on the new moons and on the solemn feast, on the solemn feast, three times in a year, even the feast of unleavened bread, and in the feast of weeks, and in the feast of tabernacle, he knows all the book of Leviticus. He knows the book of Deuteronomy. He knows what Exodus says. The Bible says that a king was to write his own copy of the law. Now let me ask you a question. 
What does our Bible say? It says the King James Version. And the king was to write his own version, his own book. You can't get a king that writes an NIV. You can't get a king that writes a new King James. You can't get a king that writes any other perverted, junky Bibles. It's not sealed of the king. King James says, I'll tell you what, I'll write the entire Bible for everybody. So everybody can have a copy. You know what the other perverted Bibles do? They put a copyright on it. So you can't copy it unless you get permission and pay them money and royalties. Solomon knows the law. Solomon is obeying the law. Get that. But he still has his wife and he's still getting these horses from a place he wasn't supposed to. When he, wouldn't you think he would like to change the Bible? And he appointed according to the order of David his father, the courses of the priests to their service, and the Levites to their charges. The praise, well, to the right there is he makes sure the Levites get their food and they get their pay, they get their housing. He makes sure the Levites are well taken care of. Because if you take care of the Levites, God's going to take care of you. Now we're all priests today. We're all kings today. And to minister before the priest as duty of every day required. I mean, they need to eat. They need a place to sleep. They have daily activities. The porters also buy the courses at every gate. All right, those guys are the doorkeepers. You better think about them. And you better take care of them because these guys make sure, you know, the proper people go in and the people who don't belong keep them out. And maybe something, maybe they kept charge of who was there, how long it was supposed to be and stuff like that. But don't leave them out. So, for so had David the man of God commanded. And they departed not from the commandment of the king unto the priests and Levites concerning any manner, matter, or concerning the treasuries. Now, all the work of Solomon was prepared unto the day of the foundation of the house of the Lord, and until it was finished. So the house of the Lord was perfected. It wasn't just built, it was perfected. It was made to the glory and honor and sealed and signed and checked and made sure it was done for the Lord. It was done properly for the Lord and obey everything in those blueprints that God gave David to do. In other words, they double checked their work even after the work was done. If you're going to do something for the Lord, you better make sure you do it right. Then went Solomon to Ezogeber and to Eliab at the seaside in the land of Edom. And Hiram sent him by the hands of his servants ships and servants that had knowledge of the sea. All right, these would be seamen. Evidently, I guess Jews didn't have the knowledge or did not want to know the knowledge, but uh, when it came to being seamen, he had to get other people to do the job. And they went out with the servants of Solomon to Ophir. All right, Jews went out, but they weren't in charge of the boats for some reason. That doesn't seem to be a Jewish thing. And took thence 450 talents of gold and brought them to king of, of to King Solomon. So now he's got a navy. He, he's got he's got this navy. They come back. They bring all kinds of stuff, peacocks and stuff like that. You you read the list, like what on earth would Solomon want that for? And he's got caravans coming through, like the Queen of Sheba. And she brings everything she's got to bring to Solomon, and he gives to her things. And he's got you know he's got trading all around. Jerusalem has become the center of the known world. Solomon has to build storehouses everywhere because he's getting a vast 
amount of stuff. And he's giving out vast mounds of stuff. He's got a rich empire that, that the stones are like uh, silver and gold. And he's doing it all for the Lord, but he's got this sin. He's got this, this problem in his life. And he's still going to church. And he's still offering like he's supposed to. And he doesn't realize that this sin has got more touch to him than God has touched with him. And it's going to get him. We'll stop right there.